Welcome to the first Jerry Pal Journal of the American Geriatric Society, or JAGS, podcast. This is Eric Widera. This is Alex Smith. And for our very first uh, Jerry Pal JAGS podcast, uh, we have invited a guest. So we have Shi Yi Wang, who is assistant professor in the School of Public Health at Yale. And uh, welcome to the Jerry Pal podcast, Shi Yi. It's my honor to be here. Uh, we start off, as as always, with a, a song request from Alex. Do you have one? Favorite band? Either Beatles or Eagles. Or Eagles. Okay, well, I know a bit of both. We've done a lot of Beagles on this show. We haven't done any Eagles, so let's do a little, a little bit of Eagles here. I like the way your sparkling earrings lay. Against your skin so brown And I want to sleep with you in the desert tonight With a million stars all around I got a peaceful, easy feeling I know you won't let me down Cause I'm already standing on the ground. Excellent. Uh, so we're talking with you about your paper in JAGS, the Journal of the American Geriatric Society, about end-of-life care transition patterns of Medicare beneficiaries. Would you say that end-of-life care transition patterns are peaceful or easy? Of course not. <laughs> um, we, we all know that end-of-life care in the United States actually uh, is generally very aggressive. So that's the reason uh, uh, I'm interested in to understanding health care transitions and the under the patterns of a uh, transition trajectory. And a little bit about what we know about this already before this came out. Um, you know, quoted in your introduction, you talk about Joan Tino's study looking at healthcare transitions just over the last decade from 2000 to 2009, um, while hospital deaths and um, hospice use have increased, uh, the number of healthcare transitions have significantly increased. So we're seeing this pattern of, I, I think one word to use is churn amongst uh, Medicare beneficiaries near the end of life. Is, is that right? Is that a good summary? Yeah, actually, uh, this project is motivated by uh, John Tenno's paper, uh, John Ma's paper. We, we all know that uh, multiple transitions have the potential for poorly coordinated care uh, medical errors, duplication of a diagnostic workouts, and the changes in the management. Um, and the, they, they can be uh, burdensome for individuals and their family members and uh, very costly to the society. Very good. So maybe uh, you could start off um, by telling us uh, w what you did sort of in a snapshot, uh, you know, big picture view uh, that our listeners could understand? So uh, we analyzed uh, Medicare beneficiaries uh, or decedents in 2011, but specifically we, we tried to understand uh, transition trajectories and the national variation of the transitions and the uh, the factors associated with multiple transitions. Uh, more excitingly, I mean, we, we produce Sankey diagrams to visualize the sequences of a healthcare transitions. Yeah, so um, I was very impressed. So we'll have a link to the article and... Uh an image of uh, figure two, which was the sequence of care transitions in the last six months of life for Medicare beneficiaries. 
But it's basically a, a very detailed diagram of what happens to people if they start off at home or home hospice or SNF in a hospital. And you can see the flow of these individuals over time through these multiple transitions. Do you want to give us a little bit of a summary of, of what we're actually um, seeing with these transitions? Okay, so um, um, the Senki diagram, diagrams uh, uh, have been used in science and engineering for decades. Basically, the diagrams is a specific type of a flow diagram in which the width of the flows are shown proportionally to the flow uh, quantity. So we can see patients move from home uh, or hospital to other uh, healthcare settings and, uh, and uh, keep moving. So we can, we can visualize the sequences. So, and, and when we're, and when we're seeing this, we're seeing, so it sounds like for these sequence flow diagrams, the, the larger the, um, the, what's the right word? Uh, uh, the area? The larger the area, um, the more individuals are in that. And as it gets smaller, uh, the less individuals are in that. Is that right? Yes, correct. So for, for the, the picture uh, in this, um, in that diagram, actually, we can see that 32.8% uh, of the decedents had four or more than four transitions in their last six months of life. And the majority, actually, about 20% of the decedents transition from home first to hospital second to home or skill nursing facility, then third, back to hospital, and the fourth, a, another healthcare setting. I mean, it, one, it 20 percent of them had had this kind of a sequence, uh, transition sequence. And I, I am surprised that they have there are so many people. Uh, who went through this, uh, I would say, terrible care. And, um, you know, when we're thinking about transitions in care, it, um, do we have any data to suggest that multiple tra transitions are associated with poor quality of care, poor satisfaction uh, rated by patients? Uh, like, how do we know it's uh, potentially poor quality care? It, it, it's, a good, it's a good point. So far, we don't have the data uh, to directly link uh, healthcare transitions and uh, um, patient satisfaction, uh, quality of care, etc. This is one of the limitations because some transitions actually are necessary, but uh, such uh, profound or so many transitions in the end of life does in, does it indicate uh, fragment, fragmented care during this uh, important period of life. Yeah. And there's some variability, it looks like, too. It depends a little bit on uh, what state you happen to live in. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, uh, there is substantial uh, variation in uh, number of transitions across states uh, from a low of 1.8 in Alaska uh, to a high of 3.1 in New Jersey. Oof, don't want to live in New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, just looking at these, you know, state by state mean number of transitions, I was trying to identify a pattern. I'll just read for our listeners here the states with the lowest number of transitions, the, the, the sort of uh, top five lowest. We have Alaska, Utah, Hawaii, um, Idaho, Montana. So sort of much more rural states generally. 
That and definitely then, seems to be a pattern. There there's, there's a, seems to be some pattern. And then the other end of the spectrum, you have top five highest number of transitions. New Jersey, Illinois, Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, and West Virginia. So it seems to, you know, there's some rural states in there as well. Um, uh, so there's, 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 there seems to be uh, some pattern of rural states having fewer transitions. Um, but there is also there are also some states that are sort of more rural that have a high number of transitions. Florida, I see, is the next one on the list. That would be number six. Yeah, and, and actually, Oregon is one of the best uh, state uh, because it's it's the I, I believe is the sixth lowest uh, state in terms of mean number of care transitions. So. I mean, yeah, of course, rural areas, um, pa- um, patients in rural areas were less likely to have a multiple transitions because the, 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 the access to uh, health care systems. Yeah, that's for sure. It's interesting that the rural states that have high numbers of care transitions tend to be located in the southeastern United States. You're looking at Mississippi, Louisiana, for example. Um, yeah, so, so it does seem to be a pattern there as well. You know, it seems there was another major point of this article about hospice use um, and early hospice use in particular. Could you talk about that, Shi Yi? Yeah, um, perhaps I can take one step back. Um, one is, I would say, one is hospital uh, palliative care program. I mean, I think it's important. I believe uh, Sean uh, has a uh, podcast uh, this month. So... Yeah, we had uh, Sean Morrison on our podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yep. Yeah, so, so basically I think it's very important that um, hospital palliative care program can uh, can can have an impact on um, end of life care transitions if uh, the program can can disseminate their care to more uh, patients in hospital because most of the patients have had the had an experience uh, with hospitalization before they die. So that, that's one thing that I want to emphasize, and the return back to your question that um, I believe that hospice use uh, might be underutilized in some areas because um, for in the um, in the states with multiple uh, transitions they tend to receive uh, hospital care but they did not refer they they were not referred to hospice early enough, and actually, uh, uh, Joanne Tenno's group has uh, demonstrated that show hospice use uh, hospice use in a very short period of time might not be uh, beneficial uh, for for beneficiaries because uh, they still receive aggressive end of life care until to the very end of life, then they, they kind of, they were put into the hospice. So it's important to have a hospice uh, service uh, earlier so that we can uh, prevent uh, multiple care transitions. So it looks like from uh, your article is that, you know, one big difference between, let's say, Utah, uh, a low transition state to New Jersey, a high transition state, is that hospice use looked like it was much more common uh, earlier on, 90 days, 150 days, 180 days before death versus New Jersey, where it was relatively infrequently used. Am am I seeing that correctly? Yes. Uh, Of course, if we only look at the last day, I mean, the date of death, it's about forty percent to fifty-five uh, percent, but but I would argue that uh, it's not just only the 
the the hospice utilization is also the timing of a hospice utilization. Mm -hmm. uh, we can see across the the time horizon, uh, the the proportion of a uh, patients who used hospice in Utah uh, was higher than that in uh, in New Jersey. So I think that's the key. Can that also be, I mean, I can imagine that could be explained by both systems factors um, and also patient preferences. Um, do we have any indication from this study on, on what causes these differences among states? No, I mean, unfortunately, we, we don't have a patient preferences. And actually, we, we, we also think this is an urgent uh, research, future research to understand patients first preferences as well as uh, the transition, uh, care transition and the quality of care uh, or, or patient satisfaction. And I also think that uh, Utah may, may also have, have, have a, a stronger family bond so that um, family members can help or can take care of uh, the patients maybe also the reason why Utah uh, can have a lower um, uh, transition numbers. Yeah, it actually reminds me too of, we just had Michael Fracken on to talk about delivering palliative care in rural America and uh, some of the differences that we see in urban America. And I, I wonder how much that, that I learned from uh, Michael on that podcast also applies to this study, looking at the differences between what we're seeing rural versus more urban areas as far as multiple transitions. Um, and that could be, again, patient factors. It could be um, other issues around systems of care. It also reminds me that, you know, even within these states, there's tremendous heterogeneity. Yeah. So that, you know, within a big state like California, for example, there are major urban centers, and then there are vast swaths of California that are very rural. And that's true for a number of the states on this list. Yeah, and I, I think back to again Joan Tino's work. How you know, even within a city, uh, hospitals mm -hmm. can be right next to each other, and even use one can have very high versus very low uh, utilization of things like peg tubes with advanced dementia. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so what's next? What's next for you as far as this research? So um, we we would like to know. Um, Patients' preferences, especially for those who uh, who were enrolled in hospice. So I, I mean, the CMS right now has the uh, CAPS uh, hospice survey. So potentially we can understand more about uh, patients' preferences as as well as family members' preferences in uh, in hospice. Uh, enrollment. Yeah. Great. And, and what's what's your major take home finding that we can take away from this? Not just in terms of future research, but is there anything that we can take away if, as clinicians who are practicing, or in terms of change to the healthcare system? Um, I think uh, we can use Utah as a benchmark, so that. Uh, other other states, uh, physicians in other states should should consider that uh, try to avoid uh, aggressive end of life care and uh, also understand uh, patients' preferences and uh, to have uh, some kind of a health uh, uh, goal of care goals of care or health or care plans for individual patients. Also, we think um, um, and the, uh, hospice utilization as well as uh, palliative care program should, should extend and uh, to help patients to make uh, their end of life care treatment decisions. That's, that's what, uh, oh, oh, finally, I think uh, 
data visualization will help uh, researchers, patients, and uh, clinicians to communicate uh, the potential or the tr care transition trajectories. I think that's all. That's terrific. You know, I think that the, the sequence diagram, the sequence of care transitions, uh, she is brilliant. It's a brilliant image. And so it's so terrific that you've brought that methodology into the healthcare field and health policy. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I love the idea of visualizing uh, data in ways that um, brings new insights and it makes it much more um, uh, easy to understand what all this means instead of just a table. Right, and this, this uh, you, you tweeted this through the uh, Journal of the American Geriatric Society account, which we should note is at AGS Journal. And that that tweet went, you know, viral. You know, so viral for geriatrics, okay, is not thousands of retweets. <laughs> it's you know tens, twenties, thirties, forties. That's viral. We count that as viral. And I think part of the reason it went viral is because the picture told the message so clearly. Yeah. And it drew people in in ways that a table would not have. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually. It, it's 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 inspired by uh, Hans Rosling. Uh, he has a great talk, TED talk uh, before. Unfortunately, he died uh, mm. in February. Yeah, I mean, I believe you all, uh, you have all seen his his talk about global health, that kind of bubble. I I think that that's a fantastic way to to show results and the to communicate with uh, others. Yeah. We can put a link to his TED Talk below. Oh, hey, Alex, do you want to um, uh, end us off with yes. uh, a little more? Yes, happy to end with a little more Eagle. Shi Yi, thank you much, so much for being part of the Jerry Pell Podcast today. We really appreciate you joining us. I found out a long time ago What a woman can do your soul Ah, but she can't take you anyway You don't already know how to go Cause I got a peaceful easy feeling I know you won't let me down Cause I'm already standing on the ground